better pack them up, boys. I've been talking about the end times. This is called the mystery of Babylon. Who is it? And we're going to go through some end time things, and we're going to look at some things uh, that have transpired. These are important based on uh, as we move into the end times and, and as we are in the end times, it's very important for us to understand some things about the end times and how, because one of the questions everybody has is what's going to happen to us? I can't find a United States in here. You know what? Y'all are going to have to tell me when you get there how it was because I'm so pre-trib I don't eat post toasties. I am going in the rapture, and I'm going in the first, the first boatload. And, and the reason we may, might get into this a little later on, uh, I've talked about this a little bit in the past. Uh, you can turn to Revelation chapter 16. Uh, and, and we're going to skip around. We're going to go into the Old Testament and look at some... some uh, what you have to understand about the end times, do, people that read Revelation and try to figure out what's going to happen in the end have missed more than half, more than half. The Revelation is only about a third of the prophecy of the end time. Revelation was written by John, uh, the, as, as he put it, the the apostle that Jesus loved or the disciple that Jesus loved, the same John that wrote the gospel of John and John, first John, second John, and third John. And, and uh, he wrote it on an island of Papamus. I believe that uh, this was after he, they had tried to boil him in oil and uh, he, he, he didn't die. And so they didn't know what to do with him. So they exiled him to an island where they only sent the worst criminals that they didn't want anywhere around them. And they sent John there. Uh, he was there for a, for a season. I hate it when my computer does this, so I'm going to fix it right now. It always tells me it wants to restart, and then I'm in a mess. Um, we, uh, John did, the, uh, as he went there, I believe that what happened was actually... They did John a favor because it's good to get alone with the Lord. And John began to have a, a vision and a revelation from the Lord that when you will put yourself, don't, don't say I'm telling you that you need to be exiled or anything else. I'm, I don't believe that that needs to happen. If I set myself apart to hear from the Lord, you will have the same kind of visions and the same revelations about things in your life just because you spend time with the Lord. Somebody says, well, will he tell you what the end times is? I don't know. It tells you. It says that he'll tell you of things to come. So he might tell you of things that are about to happen, but I'm not promising that's what's going to happen. I'm telling you that you will hear from the Lord and you will get a, a word from the Lord that'll be a significant word that you can base what you do in your life on because he's given you something to do. This church is here because a vision that God gave Kathleen and I when we came uh, to Weatherford to, to start uh, something. He showed me what the building was going to look like. This first building is part of what he showed me. It's not the finish of what it's going to look like. What he didn't show me was what that he never showed me the Billy Astridge Memorial Building. So realize that there are some things that you will do outside of the vision but hold fast to the vision and do what the vision uh, is. Don't let go of it. St hang on to what, what the Lord tells you. The vision will always line up. And here's a, here's a, a good reference of, at what I'm talking about. When the vision will always line up with Scripture. God won't have you do something completely opposite of what the Word says. The vision and the revelation that is in the book of Revelation is called Revelation because it's the, and if you look at it, it says the revelation of John. It was a personal revelation to John that the Lord told him to write down about the end times, but it was based and give and, and coincides with Scripture in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, in Daniel. 
And so when I say you're only looking at, at, at about a third of the end time prophecy in the book of Revelation, it's because it lines up with what Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Daniel had visions and prophesied about the end times. So uh, that being said, um, and I, I told you to go to Revelation 16. I, I'm going to read Revelation 14, 8 first. Uh, <clears throat> And we're just, I'm just going to read one verse there. And it says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen the great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of her fornication. That's Revelation 14.8. When will the prophesied Babylon fall? And that's what we're going to look at today, because we know that, that the... Uh, the place, the literal Babylon, fell already uh, many centuries ago. Now, we're going to look at 1616. In Revelation 1616, it announces the beginning of the battle of Armageddon. And he gathered them together in a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now, the Hebrew tongue, uh, the way uh, it, it says Armageddon in that place, the Hebrew tongue actually pronounces it Armageddon. And Armageddon means down from Megiddo. When you go to uh, Israel, and I, I didn't have a picture to put up this morning. I was going to show you a picture of looking down from Megiddo. Megiddo was a, a city that for many centuries passed from one uh, ruler to another. And in Megiddo, uh, it's nothing but ruins now, but there's a lot of ruins there. And when you look down, you look down on the valley of uh, Armageddon or Megiddo, which, which means down from Megiddo. And in, in, when you look at this valley, what you can literally see, it's just like a big bathtub. There's really no place out of it. There's no, uh, a lot of times when we look at valleys, we can see that uh, there's a, a low spot that you go through. We, we might call it a draw uh, or a, a, a place where we could pass between two mountains. Well, the valley of, uh, of Armageddon or the valley of Megiddo is... Uh, nothing but a, like a large bathtub with hills all the way around it. So we can see that in a place, and we're not really going to talk about this today, but you can see in that valley how the blood could run and stand as deep as a horse's bridle. Now, uh, we, have, uh, we have horses of all different sizes. I don't think that the Bible's talking about miniature horses. Um, I, I have no idea what, what kind of horse it's going to be. Uh, the horses I've seen over there are not as large as some of the ones that we have. But at any rate, when you talk about as deep as the, the bit on a, a horse, even on the smallest horse, you're talking about blood running this deep. And when you look at the valley, it's going to be, it's, it's huge. And, and it's almost unfathomable to see uh, or think how that, that would happen. The next three verses record the, the fall of Babylon the Great. So let's look at those three verses. An angel, uh, we're looking at 17, and the angel, the seventh angel poured out his vial in the air. You know, let me open my Bible because I, I actually, when I did my, uh, my notes, I skipped part of uh, one of these verses. Let's read the, the verses in... Uh, their entirety, uh, 17, 18, and, and uh, 19. There's another whole sermon right there. <clears throat> that was probably Wednesday night. Um, verse 17, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven and the throne saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, 
Such a mighty and great earthquake has not occurred since men were on the earth. And when we think about that, you know, there's been some huge earthquakes, a uh, lot of devastation. It's talking about an earthquake like has never been known. So I, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like. It goes on. In verse 19, it says, Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of wine of his fierce wrath. Now, in, uh, in these three verses, uh, the great Babylon is talking about the Babylon to come, not the, not the uh, Babylon that we know uh, from the past. This passage clearly teaches us that the destruction of Babylon, this is a figurative Babylon, uh, and, and it is a sign of tyranny and rebellion against God and his ways, and it'll take place during the Battle of Armageddon. And we can look at tyranny and and uh, rebellion, and, and we know what that is. We know that that has caused the fall of, of nations in the past, uh, and it has caused uh, many people that have been in tyranny. What is tyranny? This can be class participation. Tyranny is repression. Okay. Oppression against what? Tyranny against the Bible would be what? Standing against the Bible, saying, oh, that's not true. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to get, we can look at the, at the world today and we can see many religions that have tried to stand against God and say, this is the way that you do it. And, and there's uh, uh, some cults that, that come to our mind uh, from the recent past and some that come from uh, way, way, way back. Um, but these are the, this is the destruction of the great Babylon is going to be a worldwide, not just a small religion, but a worldwide uh, religion that stands against. I believe, and we'll see as we go, that we haven't even seen this religion yet uh, in this time. And I'm going to tell you that there's all kinds of uh, different uh, teachings and thoughts out there that are unfounded. Uh, I, I, there is one, one teacher that tried to teach that it was, was uh, the Islam. There's one teacher that tried to teach that it was Catholicism. There's one teacher, you know, so we can look at a broad spectrum. I believe that when we look, and as we look into this, this teaching today, we'll find out that a t that it can actually be a religion that's created in almost a day. And uh, not, not a day as we know it, but in a very, very short time that proceeds. Because it talks about the, the League of Nations. It talks about uh, the ten-headed beast. It talks about several different things. So I don't want you to get, and if you, and, and I brought those up because if you uh, search this kind of uh, prophecy out on the internet, you're going to find all kinds of stuff that all kinds of people have different ideas about. Base what you see on what the Bible says and not what just somebody says. Now, somebody says, well, I can't understand what it's talking about. If you'll study back in Ezekiel, we don't have time to go all the way through Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Daniel today. But if you'll look at those things, if you have a curiosity about them, then uh, you'll, you'll be able to find a lot more information. Base your thinking on what the Word of God says, not what somebody else says to you. The entire Old Testament, and this is another prophecy about uh, Babylon. Jeremiah 
uh, chapter 50, verses 1 to 23. And, and we're going to kind of skip down through some of that because to, to read everything that pertains to this this morning, uh, we would be here sometime uh, Tuesday, I believe, to, to get through uh, everything that I had, had looked at. Uh, the, in the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah devoted his prophecy on the destruction of Babylon or the destruction of Jerusalem and to carry away Israel into Babylon captivity. That was talking about the literal Babylon. It was talking about the, the Babylon of that day. He also re prophesied the return of Israel to Jerusalem after 70 years and foretold of the ultimate destruction of Babylon. And uh, the ultimate destruction of Babylon uh, is not just the, the first part. And, and we're going to read this. This is, uh, uh, and this is just going to be parts from uh, 1 to 15. It says, The word of the Lord spoke against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. Declare ye among the nations and publish and set a standard. Publish and conceal not. Say Babylon is taken. For out of the north there shall come up a nation against her which shall make her land desolate and none shall dwell therein. Because of the wrath of the Lord it shall not be inhabited but it shall be wholly desolate Every one that goeth by Babylon will be astonished and hiss at all her plagues. Now, verse 17 and 18 establish for certainty when this destruction of Babylon was to occur. Cure. So, if you're there, if you happen to be there, or she's probably getting it on the screen. Uh, Jeremiah 50, 17 and 18 says, Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. The first, the king of Asra, hath devoured him. The last, his Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has broken his bones. Therefore, saith, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land, as I have punished the king of Ezra. The above scriptures prophesied the destruction of Babylon, and it would, it would occur during the empire of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, in verse 39 and, and 40, it declared that Babylon would never again be inhabited. Therefore, wild beasts, this is what it says in 39 and 40, therefore the wild beasts of the deserts, the wild beasts of the islands will dwell there, and owls shall dwell therein, and it shall be no more an inhabited for a short season. It says forever. Um, now, there's two destructions of Babylon that are foretold in the Bible. And that's what we're going to look at. Now, I've, I've, I've laid a foundation by the destruction of the first Babylon. We also know that there was a vision that God gave Nebuchadnezzar uh, of what was going to happen and how it was going to happen. And, and down through, part of that pertained to the last days and part of it pertained to that time there. If you uh, look at that, you can see that... that uh, uh, the ten toes uh, was yet yet to come uh, in the great statue that he saw, but part of it was actually the prophecy of his kingdom fallen. So we want to look at the, the difference. Uh, yet the book of, of Revelation talks about the fall or the destruction of Babylon. We can see how that had happened and, and, what, and so what it is talking about. We want to look at the difference between literal Babylon and, versus mystery Babylon. The physical city of Babylon originally built by Nimrod after the fall. The reason it was called Babylon, it was where the Tower of Babel was built. Nimrod built that uh, tower there and that's what became uh, the, ki the kingdom or the city of, of Babylon and became great. Uh, it was about 55 miles uh, from where Baghdad 
uh, Iraq stands today. The name Babylon came from the Tower of Babel that was constructed there. Babylon became a large city of global prominence around 1728 B.C. during the reign of Hambi. The glory years of Babylon were achieved under Nebuchadnezzar between uh, 604 and 562 uh, B.C. The city declined during the reign of Belteshazzar, which was uh, Babylon's, or uh, excuse me, Nebuchadnezzar's predecessor, and came to ruin when Exes the Persian king destroyed it in 478. To this day, Babylon has never been rebuilt. Uh, king uh, or uh, Saddam Hussein uh, set in to rebuild the city of Babylon in the 1980s, and it was halted during the Gulf War, and it has, to this day, has never returned to build anything. We know that he's not going to return to build anything uh, himself. But uh, Babylon is, as the literal Babylon, will never be inhabited again. Sometimes I have a question when we send money uh, as a, and this is a side note, as, as a nation, uh, to places that God says will never be inhabited again. And uh, that's one of the things that we as Christians need to pray. And when I talk about biblical principles, these are some of the things. What does the Word say about it? We don't want to be behind something that the Word goes, says is not going to happen uh, in that place. Babylon is described in Revelation. Turn to, to Revelation 17, 3 and 4. It is described and is called Mystery Babylon. See why I wanted you back on the front? By the way, there's nothing to matter with the back row. It just was uh, odd for me every time I used to look over here and here was Jeff and Pat and now they were back there. That's the only reason I said that. I gave you a chance to get there, so here we go. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit on a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her, na na head, upon her forehead was, written, was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Who is Mystery Babylon? Now, I want to look at a couple of things in there before we really look at, at who Mystery Babylon uh, is. Why is Mystery Babylon called a harlot? Why did they use a woman in this place? What this represents is, and, and many times through the New Testament, God talked about, and in the Old Testament about Israel, talks about committing fornication against him. In other words, when we, uh, and it's not talking about the literal sex act, what it's talking about is how we project ourselves spiritually in what we do. Do we prostitute ourselves by going to other gods? Do we see, and this is what it's talking about. This is why he called her, because she literally is coming against uh, the against the Word of God, against the church, against what God, what Jesus Christ himself did for you and I. <clears throat> Clue one, Mystery Babylon is a city. Notice in the above prophecy that the woman is used to symbolize Mystery Babylon. Verse 18 of the chapter tells us that the woman is a city. Did you see that? Let's read it again. Verse 18. 
17, 18. It says, And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now, the ten heads, uh, or the seven heads and the ten horns uh, are a projection of nations that will come together that will be behind uh, this, uh, what, what it's called in a woman, uh, or we know that it'll be a great city, it'll be a place. This is after the time uh, that the uh, Antichrist has already come on the scene and done the things that he was going to do. Uh, and clue two, Mystery Babylon presides over a vast international system. The ten horns, the seven heads represent the vast international uh, system. Not only is this woman a city, uh, in verse 1, let's look at verse 1. We're told that the woman sits on many waters. And one of the seven angels who had bowls came and talked to me saying, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Verse 15 explains the meaning of these waters. And when he said to me, the waters which you saw were the harlot, where the harlot sits, are peoples, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. So that place we see the seven heads and the ten horns in that place because that represents that it won't be a nation it won't be an international system that'll just be on one continent, but it'll be on many continents. It may overtake uh, a, a large portion of the world. Uh, you'll have to tell me if this continent becomes part of it because I'm not going to be here when this happens. And, uh, and I'm joking, I know you're not going to be too. If, if, if you do think you're going to be, then you and I need to spend some time together after church so that we can uh, make sure that you're saved filled with the Holy Ghost, ready to go on in the first boatload and, and not have to wait through the tribulation. I don't want to wait for that tribulation. That would be uh, something that would keep me uh, on the straight and narrow my entire life because I want to go in the first bunch. <clears throat> not only is the woman a city, but apparently the headquarters of a vast international system. Clue three. The city on seven hills. Let's look at verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Verse 9. Where is the mind which has wisdom? The seven heads and are seven mountains which the woman, on which the woman sits. So we can see that the seven mountains, what could that represent? She would be the head over some nations or international systems. Uh, I, I want to read some things to you from... Uh, and this is actually from Dake's notes. Uh, Mystery Babylon, there's 13 proofs that the whore is a religious system. <clears throat> Playing the whore in a symbol, symbolic language always refers to rig, religious fornication and idolatry. Literal fornication must be understood in, in some of these. You know, we got to understand what what fornication really is. That, that's cheating. That's uh, doing... Uh, and I realize that I'm not in a place that needs a lot of explanation, but we got to think of it in that same light. I've got to have fidelity towards God. If I want to walk in the blessings, I, I love the, the testimony that was shared this morning uh, because uh, it was, you know, every time I uh, give a testimony for God, I... I get blessed going and coming. Well, you know what? It's God's plan to bless you going and coming. But if you don't stay faithful to God, 
See, I, I don't expect that if I wasn't faithful to my wife, that she'd hang around and, and want to be part of my life. Well, when I'm not faithful to God, it, He still loves me. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God, which does not mean that you can't get separated from the love of God. I'm not saying that He doesn't still love you, but if you choose to commit fornication with some other God or some other thing, maybe it's just something that's your, your hobby and, and you want to get in. Again, I know I'm not in a place like that, but sometimes we have to look at these things and realize how simple it can be to get off and into it because we can look and say, well, how can people get so off in, in that area? You know, they're off all over the world. And, and we can see how it literally could happen. And, and there's, I know there's a lot of times that, that uh, reading the Old Testament, we could think, well, man, look what God did for Israel. But yet they ran after other gods. Well, they got involved with other nations. And when they got involved with other nations and they let their uh, personal desires overcome their love for God, did that separate them from the love of God? No, God still called them the apple of his eye. Nothing can separate you and I from the love of God. But we can make a choice to leave that love and to do, and that's exactly what this is, what uh, Dakes was talking about in this place. We have to understand literal fornication in order to understand how religious fornication can happen. Number two, he says, causing the many nations to commit fornications with her proves uh, with that adulterous religious practices are being referred to as the passage above. She is not a political power, for she has not classed as with one of the kings. You know, and I want you to look at that. Even though it's going to be an international system, it's going to be an international religious system that is the mystery Babylon because she wasn't classified as one of the kings or one of the rulers, not classified as the beast, but instead as the one that leads off uh, people. The beast which the woman rides on in, rides in the eighth kingdom will be made up of waters or peoples inside the old Roman territory. And there's several things in this um, that point to uh, the head of this being in, you know, in the, the old Roman ter territory doesn't mean Rome. The Roman territory was quite large uh, at that time. And, I, and I'm not saying that it couldn't be Rome, but based on the things that it says about the Roman territory, and I've, I've kind of wet your whistle a little bit by reading some of the things we've read this morning. I want you to, to uh, look at, at these chapters and, and look at them in a, in a relationship with the Old Testament simply because. Now, some of this could come on the scene and could be on the scene right now. I'm not telling you that to not worry about this. You're going to be gone anyway. But we're not going to be here at the Battle of Armageddon. We're not going to be here at the end of the system. But some of the system could be in place right now because of the times that we're in, in uh, relationship to the things that it said would happen in the, old, in the, in the last days. Uh, the attire of the great whore identifies her as a religious system or as a whore committing spiritual fornication, uh, duping political powers by her whoredoms and idolatry. The fourth verse of chapter 17. Let's read that. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abomination and abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Now remember, abomination is something that is against biblical teaching. It's, it's, so it's religious, uh, religious things, not uh, necessarily that it's going to be a world power, but it's going to be a world system. 
Her name, Mystery Babylon, indicates that she is not literal Babylon, but the word mystery identifies her with the religious rites and mysteries uh, uh, of ancient Babylon. So because she, ha because she has the name of, of Babylon, it's going to be something that will pertain to uh, the first Babylon in that place. Now, why, why should we be aware of these things if we're not going to be here for the battle of Armageddon? I'm going to tell you, when the devil tries to take you off someplace, he doesn't grab you and try to run. It's a little bit at a time. A little bit at a time. You know, because if he just walked up and, and literally, I won't do this, okay, and literally slapped you on the face, you'd go, Tch, are you stupid? All of it, we, we wouldn't follow. But if he just gave you a little bit of seed and a little bit of seed, I'm going to tell you, there's, a, there's, I believe if I remember right, it was 478 people or was it 1,478 people that drank poison Kool-Aid with Jim Jones. 478, that's what I was thinking. Okay, so let's, let's just look at that. For, and, and, and this is important in relationship to what it's talking about, about this mystery Babylon and, and being a religious uh, Babylon, not a, not a, a literal Babylon, and, and not being a world power. Because all of those people, Jim Jones was an Assembly of God pastor who had literally healed the sick. And, and, I mean, people had come into his church in San Francisco. He was right on, preached the word, did, I mean, the people really got healed and, and, at, and left wheelchairs and things. And all of a sudden, he started thinking about how great he was. And when he started thinking about how great he was, he had to fabricate the healing that went on because and this is all history, so it's not something that's not, not something you can't find. Look it up, uh, because what I'm telling you is how easily we can start getting off when we get in the wrong position. A man that started out right, but begin to think too much of himself, begin to all of a sudden he's got all these people that follow him off to another country and are willing to die just because he says, let's drink this and it's time. See, a little by little, by little by little by little, we've got to make sure that we stay hooked up in the direction that God's going. That's why I tell you, I challenge you this, that it doesn't matter what I teach you here. If I can't back it up here, then don't believe it. Take it and look at it back it up. I will always tell you when it's my opinion or when I've based it on, and, and I don't, you don't very often find me just sharing my opinion. I may share it on a personal level with somebody just because I've been thinking about this. Uh, John probably catches more of that personal level uh, than anybody does, and, and uh, just because we talk about things like that occasionally. But, you know, my, my personal thoughts are based on what God's Word says. Uh, I... Uh, and I've always loved this about Sean. Sean always uh, would say, uh, Proverbs says this. And, and uh, you know, we got to be based on what the Word says. Know what the Word says. Base your life on that, and you won't get off in this place. And that's why it's important for us to look at these things. I look back at, at, at some of the things that Dake said, and I'm not going to read them all, and, and I haven't read the entirety of each thing that he said. So if you have access to a Dake's Bible... Uh, look up Mystery Babylon in, in his notes. If you don't have access to it, uh, then uh, I know that uh, Don and Barbara are able to get you hooked up with, with one, or I, I have three of them, so, uh, you know, I'll loan you one. Uh, I think this is really important, her drunkenness. It talks about her being drunk. Uh, but being drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is a religious institution that'll come because it talks about in this place that she's drunk 
on the martyrs of, of Jesus. Um, only religion has killed the martyrs of Jesus in all the ages. Governments have carried out the and dictated what the leaders of religion were going to do. Uh, I want to look at, uh, you, you know, and there's, there's unending notes that, that he wrote. Uh, now, I thought of, of some symbols, and, and this, is, this is just food for thought. The Bible calls God a he. The Bible calls Jesus a he. The Bible calls the Holy Spirit a he. The Bible calls the angels he. Um, the Bible calls you and I he. It says sons. It says in Christ he sees no gender. He doesn't see uh, man or woman. He doesn't see uh, race. We realize that. And, and then when, when I look, every place that it talks about being led off in the wrong direction, it talks about by a she. And God created sons. And when sons will stay hooked up with God, we won't be led off in these directions. And I think this was the whole... Uh, I asked the Lord, I said, why do you want me to even talk about Mystery Babylon? Because there's a lot of things that are, like I told you, there's, there's a, a lot of conjecture out there. Uh, there's a lot of things for speculation. But the whole message was how important it is to stay in a place that we're right with God. That we're living for God, we're doing what His Word says, we're following what God's word, what, what He leads us to do, and lines up with His Word. Don't just get led off because it sounds good. There's a lot of stuff that sounds good. Love is God. Yeah. See, I, I think I've conditioned a lot of people to that, and plus a lot of people know that. But really, when you hear somebody say that in a context that it is, it goes along, well, you know, that's, that's the basis of new age. It's not God is love, it's love is God. So we just love and do whatever we want to do. Because after all, that's God. Well, you can see how the enemy will take little things. You, you can change uh, a, actually a word somewhere. And when you change a word somewhere, it can lead us down. So I think when I looked at the, and, and did this, and I literally spent the, the entire day studying this and, and realizing it, and that's why I've, I've got, actually I've got 15 pages of notes. <clears throat> so you know I wasn't going to read them all today. But what I realized, and that's probably why my printer went crazy this morning. You got What? God loves you so much that he sent his only son and then he set you up in life to bless you, going and coming, to give you finances, to give you divine health, to give you... So what we've got to do is we've got to separate ourselves from my feelings and what makes me feel good. Because... If I want to walk in the abundance of everything, and, and, and I apologize that we live in a, a country that only uh, equates abundance with finances. You know, tro total prosperity is mental, it's physical, it's spiritual, it's financial, and I'm not making light of financial. I don't know about y'all, I like stuff. I like money. Reason I like money is because I can do great things with it for God. I'm going to tell you what I did this morning. Scott will enjoy this because he knows what I came back with. We came back from uh, Nigeria in January. I love how God does things. We came back from Nigeria in January. Well, between Scott and I, we had 
uh, 16,000 naira, which is 100 bucks. And I put that in. I got an envelope this morning. I got 32,900 naira. I don't know where it came from because we only put 16,000 in there. But you know what it did? It paid for two nights hotel room. That's what 32,000 will pay for. And uh, I went, I, actually it'll pay for two hotel rooms one night. And I need two hotel rooms tomorrow night uh, there and uh, for, for our driver and, and, and for me. Actually, I guess there's going to be about five in that one room. I don't know. But uh, that's just the way they do things. God wants to prosper you. God wants to multiply you. Plus, I got in there and I had, my wife asked me for money this morning, right, for tithes and offerings. I got in there this morning and I knew I had $20 that was, uh, that I've been saving for this trip. I found $54 in there this morning. I didn't know it was in there. I don't know where it came from. You know, it don't sound like much, but you know what? That's God's multiplication. And that's what God thinks about you. But in order to receive that, I've got to stay on a path that I know that God is my God, that I, He loves me. I love Him because He first loved me. He chose me, so I chose Him. All of those things, and we, we, we can go through the New Testament and find all those. Mystery Babylon, I could get off by believing this little teaching over here, or this little teaching over there, or that little teaching over there, and, because a lot of them sound good. And I really believe that that's how that religious system is going to be born in these last days, is it sounds good. Man, I'm not going to tell you it's anything. I'm not even going to start calling out names of different things. I believe that that's getting out there in a place that if you look, Dakes was a hundred years ago uh, is when he wrote, wrote those notes. I believe that what he wrote at the end is, is still correct. What he wrote at the end that I didn't read was that uh, we don't even know what that religious system is yet. It's not one that's standing as a, as a uh, known. It might be started. There might be a lot of people in it. But there is not ten nations or in seven mountains in this. There's not ten horns. There's not, there's not vast amounts. And, and yeah, we could talk about uh, different things. But what I want you to take away from this is when the rapture of the church comes, I, I am going to read this last thing he wrote because this is important. One thing must be kept in mind. All these events will take place after the rapture of the church. One note I read on this by somebody that uh, wrote it just a, uh, in the last few months. In fact, I think June of uh, 2012 uh, wrote that uh, it was idiotic to think that the rapture of the church was going to happen before the the tribulation. And uh, that, was, that was the same guy that projected that it was some religion that we already knew. You know what? Don't believe everything you read. Base it on what the scripture says. So Mystery Babylon need not be some religion now prominent inside the Roman territory. Remember I told you it was going to be based inside the Roman territory or the Roman Empire. Uh, any more than the religion Antichrist will start must be some prominent religion now in existence. Religions can be begun in one day and it will be so easy for two religions, Antichrist and Babylon's, to both start and martyr millions between the rapture and the second coming of Christ. Now, there's going to be believers during the second coming of Christ, but between during the tribulation. Bible tells us there's going to be. Um, I like leading people to Jesus, but I don't want to stay for that because it's going to be the Holy Spirit that does that. It's not going to be a choice that I make to get to stay here and, and do that. Living a right Christian life, you're going in the rapture. And everything else will be up to the Holy Spirit. Remember this. 
No one comes to the Father lest the Spirit draw him. So if no one comes to the Father, that means today. So when you're praying for people, don't try to go preach to them. Pray the Holy Spirit will anoint them, draw them, and send somebody, and it may be you. But go because the Lord sent you, not because you got a conviction that you need to get them saved. Go, you know, I, I, I go to where I go simply because I know that I'm called in that place. I am called to Weatherford, Texas. I love this church. I am called to uh, the, the Western events that we do all over the country. I am called to Nigeria, or I wouldn't even go to Nigeria. But know that God wants to use you right here to reach other people, but it's your lifestyle that's going to reach them. Live the life of a Christian. Don't try to figure out how, you know, we don't spend much time. You know, if you've been here very long, you know that uh, I've devoted about three weeks to the end times. I may, I may go on if the Lord tells me to, and I may not ever touch it again I, I, because this is what I believe. I believe that if I'm busy about the Father's business, if you're busy about the Father's business, I don't have time to worry about how that end's going to be because I'm going in the rapture. So Amen. I really don't care how it's all going to transpire. The only reason that it's important for us to know is so that we know the signs of the time so we know how to pray. God's plan is that none should perish. I get up. I say, Father, give me another thousand before you come back. And I do that every day. And uh, I got a one friend that it makes him kind of grumpy that I pray that way because he says, man, I just want him to come. Well, you know what? If you want to go, just go. Just make a decision to go uh, meet with him. Father, we thank you right now for your word. We thank you for how your word works. We thank you for each and everything that you do in our life. And Father, I thank you that as we go into these last days, Father, that you have a plan that will fulfill that plan. I pray over each and every one here, each and every one watching by internet, that we'll fulfill that plan that you have for our lives. Father, I thank you for the, the things that you give us, the things that you have given us, and the things that we're walking into. I thank you for those, and I praise you. I give you glory and honor and power in the mighty name of Jesus and by his blood. Amen. Have a great day. Remember, Jesus loves you, and so do we. As you've watched today, you've had the opportunity to hear the word preached. And as you apply that word, you'll get victory in your life. But it has to start someplace. It has to start first with a commitment to Jesus Christ as making him your Savior and then making him the Lord of your life. Paul said this in Romans 10, 8 through 10. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Well, the word of faith that Paul preached is found in the next verses. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with a mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with a heart one believes unto righteousness. So it goes like this. All you have to do is actually say, Jesus is my Savior and he is my Lord. So I'm going to invite you to say this with me this morning. Uh, and if you want to bow your head, you can bow your head. The Bible says that pray watching, and so it's okay to keep your eyes open and, and watch. But let's say this together. Say, Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I confess those sins today. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of those sins and to come into my heart and be my Savior. And I commit today that I will make you the Lord of my life. Thank you for salvation today. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you said that today for the first time, 
no matter what time of the day or night it is. Uh, welcome to the family. Welcome to knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now from this day on, make Him the Lord of your life. And as you make Him the Lord of your life, you will find out what God can do in you and through you. Also, if you've watched this broadcast, we want you to know that you can become a partner with this ministry. As you become a partner with this ministry, some of the things that you've seen throughout this uh, presentation, uh, the buck outs and, and things like that, then you become a part of that kind of ministry. And there's many people that come to know Jesus. We have offices in Nigeria and Togo, have four churches in Nigeria, one in, in Togo, and uh, we want you to know that you become a part of each and everything that this ministry does when you become a partner. You can see the information right there on your screen so that you're able to become a covenant partner with us. And as you do, we want you to know that we pray over each and every one of your offerings so that God will multiply it back to your hands according to his word. His word says in Luke 6, 38, that he gives back, pressed down, shaken together, running over to make room for more. The New Living Translation says whatever measure you use in giving large or small, it'll be used to measure what is given back to you. So we want you to know that God loves you He'll take care of you, and he'll multiply the seed that you sow in this ground with this ministry. Remember that Jesus is Lord, and Jesus loves you, and so do we.